We have Steve Friend with us now. He's an FBI whistleblower. Uh, he objected uh, to being part of the January 6th raids. He is the author of True Blue. And I wanted to get him on because he is uh, he's a guy who was in a SWAT team. And I want to know what happened uh, in Provo, Utah the other day. We had a guy who was really not able to get around. He was 75 years old. He was a guy just blowing off steam. Now, I don't agree with what he did and what he said. I think the FBI should have investigated him, but not break his door down at 6 o'clock in the morning uh, and come in with a tank through his front bay window. Maybe it's just me. Let's go to Steve Friend, who was part of SWAT teams for a long time until he couldn't take the FBI anymore. Steve, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me today, Glenn. So the FBI SWAT team, tell, tell me how this would work. You get a credible threat in, um, and you check it out. Somebody goes and tries to visit his house. He's like, you know, you don't have a warrant, and I'm not talking to you. Bring a warrant back. Then he makes more threats uh, on uh, the social media. But you've seen him. You know him. Do they do any investigation about who this person is, or are they just going to the house? Well, I, I think that's a huge problem with this particular case, because those original threats were made about five months ago, and, I, and the agents went to his house and assessed it and either deemed that he was not an imminent threat um, or they were having a hard time pushing uh, charges forward. But because he made these recent threats against the president, they used those earlier threats as additional leverage in the write-up of the affidavit for his arrest to make him seem like a greater threat and enhance the ability and enhance the tools and likelihood that SWAT would be a, a likely means to bring him into custody. And, and there's also the fact that the special agent in charge of the Salt Lake City office is brand new. And then that's somebody who basically has their rank on their sleeve with their Velcro. And they're, they're not going to be uh, pushing back against the predominant line of thinking that if there's a mm. threat of violence against a sitting president, that we need to use the special weapons and tactics team to bring them into custody. So is this, was, was this attack on this man's home, was this to send a message? Was it just uh, incompetence, laziness? What, what happened? I think that it is uh, a result of the fact that, that the FBI is now viewing uh, their agents as case managers as opposed to the agents who investigate the cases. And there's this mentality that permeates. And actually, in the software where you have your case files housed, you're called a case manager. And when you're the case manager, you're sort of moving chess pieces around the board. So if you need financial analysis done, you send the records over to the forensic accountant. And if you need evidence to be analyzed, you send it over to the lab. And then eventually, when it comes time to arrest the subject, you send the SWAT team because those are the arrest mm. guys that do that. And, and when SWAT gets involved, they have a matrix that's overly broad. You, it, just the threat of violence or the suspicion that there might be a firearm is enough to send SWAT, and that's regardless of whether or not the person is prohibited from owning a firearm. And then SWAT is going to use its protocols. It's going to come in at 6 o'clock in the morning. That's the earliest typically that you're allowed to do that because it's speed, surprise, and violence of action. You're hoping to overwhelm the person so that there's not going to be a threat. But in this case, they had had a, uh, a, a history with this gentleman, and they, they obviously knew that he wasn't an imminent threat or maybe not even physically capable of bringing these, bringing these threats to fruition. And he, had, he wasn't necessarily very ambulatory. So I think there was far better options if they had actually taken a step back and, and had rushed. Sure. But I think when there's a, this threat here, there's always this pressure that we have to use the, the, the tool at our disposal because it breathes well up the chain of command. You don't want to be the leader that said, well, I sent two agents to his house. Uh, instead of a SWAT team when he threatened to kill the president. So what is the purpose of a flash bomb? Flash, flash grenade. bang is a diversionary device. It doesn't uh, shoot out any sort of projectiles. If you, you, you hold it in your hand, you might have a, a chance of being burned. But it essentially gives the operators about one and a half seconds where it would temporarily make the person blinded, uh, would impair their hearing for some time afterwards, and it allows you to Correct. get multiple people into a room before they're able to respond and then maybe uh, fire on you. 
Correct. So you're not using it when you're in the room with the person uh, and you're already positioned shouting at each other, right? Would play no. No, I mean, obviously, if you're giving verbal commands and you've thrown a flashbang, they might not actually be able to hear you. Right. Okay. So there was a flashbang right before he was shot, but the flashbang was not in the house, and there's video. Sh- the flashbang is actually thrown uh, at, like, the garage door outside. Why would that have happened? Again, it's a diversionary technique, so it, you interrupt what's called the OODA loop of the person. So if, if they think that there's attention in one area, they might be distracted, and then you come in through another door. It makes it safer for you to come into that other door. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. No, they were... Gun trained. The, they were already in the room. They were shouting at each other. And then somebody throws it outside. Is it, do you normally... Yeah, so, I mean, throwing it in one part of the house, okay. But why would you throw it outside? To me, if somebody is holding a gun and I hear what I think is a shot, I might just freak out and shoot. Yes, and I, I think they, they, it could have been an accident. I mean, sometimes if you if you pull the pin on a flashbang, anticipating to throw it but haven't thrown it, you actually have to you say bang out. You have to throw it in a safe area. And then there's a possibility that that happened, that they were anticipating needing a flashbang, and then for whatever reason he was uh, opened the door and was then having a conversation, engaging them verbally, and they needed to uh, get the, get that flashbang so that it wasn't going to go off in the, in the operator's hand or anything like that. So that, that's a, certainly a possibility. They could have been having a uh, verbal engagement with him through a door and then eventually decided that they were going to breach. In order to do that, distract him, throw the flashbang in another area, then breach and enter. And hopefully that would give them enough time to to get to him uh, before he could respond. Does the FBI, do they wear cameras on their vests? They do not. Uh, There's a plan in place to implement body cameras. And uh, from my understanding, there's been training done on that. Uh, but I, it's not been implemented, and I'm concerned that if the decision is made to actually wear them, that the FBI will say, we don't want to reveal our tactics, so we're not going to have them rolling when we do our SWAT takedowns, but we'll use them for after effect to see, make sure that we're not mistreating anybody uh, after all the, the smoke has cleared. So uh, I don't know what to extent they're planning on making those, those recordings available especially when it comes to SWAT, because that's rarely, that's rarely necessary in the prosecution of an individual. You've already uh, built the case against them. At that point, it's not really evidentiary. Yeah, I'm not looking to build a case against, uh, uh, you know, the perpetrator here. Uh, and I'm not looking to build a case against the FBI. I am interested in seeing the truth. It's the same reason That, you know, people who didn't trust the police and, you know, at times have good reason not to trust the police. uh, They demanded that we have cameras on so we could make sure the police were doing their job and not overstepping. If the FBI is going to get involved uh, in in all of these local things and their their response is to always send in a SWAT team, I think it's important that they have cameras on them because... I don't trust them, and I don't think the American people trust them. I I agree with you on that uh, 100%, and I I think there needs to be an evaluation of the SWAT matrix. It needs to be narrowed for special circumstances that are especially risky and dangerous, and there just needs to be more critical thinking when it comes time to bringing somebody into custody using the least amount of force necessary should be what the premier law enforcement agency focuses on, which is why one of the reasons I objected to what we were doing on January 6th. We were sending a SWAT team to arrest an individual who had pledged to cooperate with us. And I thought that that presented an unnecessary risk to his safety and to our own. You know, there is um, there's something to be said for local police. The reason why local police can be much more effective is because they know the people of the community. Now, maybe none of them knew this person um, on the local police, but I don't think they were even asked. Um, You know, when you used to have Officer O'Malley and he was walking the the beat, he knew everybody because he lived on that block. Um, The local police should be involved in things like this as much as possible to where... They're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Bob, don't you know his neighbor? Don't you know? 
because that person can knock on the door and it's not an FBI SWAT team. The, the federal government doesn't seem to care about anything other than their power. And, uh, and it's got to stop. It's got to stop. It does, and, and the prime director of the FBI should be to assist these local agencies that actually have yes. the real-world knowledge, the Main Street knowledge. And I would propose even now that they, the Republicans in the House use appropriations to defund the armed agent of the FBI and force them to partner with locals because those are the agencies that know the usual suspects. And they know the community. And when you get their approval to do an investigation and get their participation, that creates a bulwark between an out-of-control FBI because the sheriff is accountable to his constituents and he can protect yep. them from the FBI coming. 